Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, love, laugh, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Fett on UBNRadio.com. And welcome. You are tuned in to my weekly talk radio show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at naturally high noon on Universal Broadcasting Network out of the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, California. And every Thursday on my syndicated CNBC News Radio channel, KCAA AM 1050. And this is a show about hope and happiness. So there's no gossip, no scandal, even though scandal is actually uh, taped here, <laughs> and no K-words, no Kardashian talk at all. Instead, I want you to focus on your own reality show and how you can be happy 88% of the time. So this is the first week of November, and as per usual, I have some very interesting guests that come on, and if you've missed any of them, Fran Drescher, Gloria Allred, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, Don Miguel Ruiz, Dr. Pat Allen, Dr. John Gray, please do visit my YouTube channel, as well as Stitcher or iTunes or TuneIn or UBN or KCAA. You'll find me everywhere so that you can learn from all those people that I find on the planet that are inspiring with their life work. And today's no exception. I actually had planned to have one of the, uh, my past guests who has become a, a wonderful friend, Don Wells, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, and do a retired professor with Marianne. I'm the professor retired professor, but she got called to do this fabulous 100 years of Universal Studios, so I didn't blame her, but I got a wonderful replacement to bring to you on the air, thanks to Leonard Carter, her manager, and that is the actress Kathy Garver, and since my largest listening base is 40 through 60, I'm sure you will remember the wonderful comedy show called A Family Affair, where she is known for her role as that spunky teenager, Sissy, on that classic CBS television series, Family Affair, which was one of the highest rated network programs in America from 1966 to 1971. However, she's also appeared in many other TV shows, including Adam 12, Matlock, The Big Valley, The Rifleman, The Patty Duke Show, and classic films like The Ten Commandments and The Night of the Hunter. She's also a producer and prolific voiceover talent. Kathy tells the story of her life on camera as well as behind the scenes in her new memoir, Surviving Sissy, My Family My Family Affair in Life of Hollywood. Please welcome to the studio, Sissy or <laughs> Kathy Garvin. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. I love that audience with all that applause. That's pretty good, Marissa. <laughs> Thank you. They love you. <laughs> they, you really know how to welcome a guest. That's quite nice. That's great. And as you, as per usual, I have a friend. She does not have an answering machine. She has a questioning machine. And when you call her, it says, who are you and what do you want? So <laughs> those are your first two questions. Who are you and what do you want? <laughs> well, I am proud to announce that I am now an award-winning author. I just heard this morning that oh. I won the People's Choice Award for my Surviving Sissy book from the Scripps Foundation uh, Books on the Banks. Wow. So, um, and you are the first uh, person, radio personality, to uh, hear my big announcement. So that's who I am. I'm an award-winning author now, Yay. Marissa. That's awesome. That You know, you heard it here first. This is Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. Cutting edge news. <laughs> yes, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Correct. And you and also won a Best Actress Award in TV, right? I, I read um, that. I have won uh, some other awards, and this book now, um, my lovely literary agent Toby is number one on Amazon uh, mm. for the ebooks uh, in Hollywood history. So 
it, it's just been a very good day, I must yes. say. Yes, and, and I'm glad and, that you well, can yes, share I that. I won a Life Achievement Award, and as old as I am, which is even past the age of your listening audience <coughs> <laughs> of 60, but I have a 24-year-old son uh, whom I had in my 40s, but he said, I, I told my son, Reed, I won this Life Achievement Award, and he says, yeah, but you're not dead yet, Mom. <laughs> oh, Thank you, that's son. <laughs> Thank you. I still got a lot of living to do. Yes, well, as as the picture show, we wanted to have you in the studio, but you're doing a book signing right now in Tennessee, so I did find some wonderful pictures of you on the internet, and you definitely are ageless. You look like you use oil of Olay. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I did this morning. I that's my moisturizer, and oh. uh, not that I'm doing a commercial for them, but yes. it, it just so <laughs> happened that uh, that is the truth. Well, I'm going to go after them after the fact and get the, get them to sponsor <laughs> yes. this show. How's that? That sounds good. <laughs> so let's go back. So the, well, what the, do I want? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> what do you want? Well, now let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Actually, answer that question. What, what do you want? Let's see I would if like I can... people to buy my book. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that, that would be nice. Mm-hmm. What do I want out of life? I, I agree with your philosophy. I think that people should be happy and have hope. It certainly has sustained me throughout my very long career in uh, Hollywood since I started at the age of, of seven. Mm. Quite near Sunset Tower Studios, as I uh, was on Paramount Studios when I okay. did the movie The Ten Commandments. Not the silent version. Um, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Wonderful. Yes, you actually worked and uh, remained friends with Charlton Heston? I did. Um, actually, I was just originally hired as a slave and an extra. Oh. <laughs> in the grandiose <laughs> epic <you> <laughs> of Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. And uh, I was just hired to go in this little wagon uh, during the exit of the scene, and all of a sudden I heard this big voice cry out, Don't let that little girl's face get in the camera! And I said, Oh, dear, Uh-oh. what did I do? Mm-hmm. Was that God? <laughs> yeah, well, it was coming from far <laughs> above me. But it wasn't God. It was cinematic deity, uh, Cecil B. DeMille, who was filming from a great big crane with his camera. Mm-hmm. So I did the scene. He came down and descended from the crane, walked over to me and uh, chatted. And then he told the associate director to have scenes written into the movie uh, for me. And he wrote wow. some. And so I was on the movie for six weeks. It was a wonderfully auspicious and blessed beginning. So the, yes, you were discovered. I was. Yeah, that's great. And then after that? After that, I proceeded to uh, work in films, and I did another one, The Night of the Hunter, which was Charles Lawton's first and last directorial uh, move into the entertainment world from being such a wonderful actor because he got such bad reviews for this incredibly wonderful movie with Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters and Lillian Gish, Mm -hmm. Peter Graves. It was a fabulous cast, uh, but it was so far ahead of its time, and it was really not recognized until later Mm -hmm. as a total film horror classic. And talk about awards, it's just won hundreds of awards as Mm -hmm. being... Uh, a great movie. Mm-hmm. And actually, I was at BYU making a speech, and uh, it is one of the movies that the theater students coming in have to analyze. Interesting. So, so did you always want to be an actor? Did you know at age seven, this is what I want to do? We, family of actors? No. I, I started singing and dancing um, when I was three. Oh. And so when you start so early, it just becomes such a natural part of one. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I said, well, yes, this is, this is what I do. Ah, great. And, and your parents supported it? Very much so. I have another book coming out, actually my third book, uh, in March, which will be Ex-Child Stars, Where Are They Now? And ah. I go through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s with the child stars from TV series mm-hmm. and right. why some of them were able to succeed. And unfortunately, some took a bad path and 
Why? Why it's is not- that? Why is that? I mean, you you're a great person to ask because you are an actress. You started young. You didn't go that route. But it is it true that that most child actors go that route, or is it or is it just the ones that end up the news on the news? So it seems like that is the normal path. It is very difficult, I believe, for an ex-child star to kind of make the transition over to a successful adult in whatever field they choose, even outside of the entertainment realm. And when you said, oh, well, did your family support you? That's one of the tenets that I think is very important for a child star. Mm -hmm. Your parents have to support you. They also have to financially support you and not treat you as their own personal bank that they can withdraw from whenever they want to Mm -hmm. pay a bill or buy themselves a dress or pay for somebody else. Mm -hmm. There were many child stars who were left penniless or did not have, you know, an iota of the earnings that they had Mm -hmm. made from all their hard work. So not only were they penniless, but they had a little resentment because of this. Sure. And many times they forego education. And I was very, uh, my, my parents said, well, my whole family went to college. Of course, I was going to go to college. I graduated from UCLA. Yeah, with I, I a, taught at uh, UCLA for six years, so we're good. We're not going to talk ah, about yes. SC. Oh, good. I'm glad, <laughs> not SC. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shh, we don't say that word either, right? <laughs> no, we don't say that. No, that's, that's almost like a K word. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> K-U-S-E. Anyway, okay. Yeah, K, K Kardashian. We don't say Kardashian here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's the K word. <laughs> yes, yes. So you went to, so, yes, you yeah, went so to I, UCLA. I got a, a degree in speech. I majored in speech with a minor in psychology. I guess that's why mm. I talk so much. And then I went back to uh, get a master's degree in theater art. So I really had uh, strength from... Uh, learning. Mm -hmm. And my dear mother, she said, "Um, gee, mom, I don't know what to major in. I've I've worked in theater and stage and film all my life. I think theater art. She said, no, 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 no. Take something where it gives you a little insurance. (laughs) (laughs) She wanted, you know, something more, you know, like being a teacher or being a nurse. She was a a nurse. So Mm -hmm. that's why I majored in speech. And I do teach speech now Mm -hmm. uh, in in my voiceover uh, teachings and workshops. And if you recognize this voice or not recognize this voice and you've just tuned in, I am speaking with Kathy Garver, best known as Sissy in the Family Affair TV series, very successful uh, back in the late 60s and 70s. And uh, she is now uh, in Tennessee talking to us from a, she's about to do a book signing at the Barnes and Noble over there for her book that just won. And we just found this out literally right now, the People's Choice Award. So you're going to have to go out and get that book. I did not have a chance to talk to your publicist quickly, but I'm hoping that you can give, because they call me the Asian Oprah. I don't know if you know that. (laughs) They started calling me that when I was speaking on stage a couple, three years ago, and it took me a year to step into those shoes. But all it means is that I have to give stuff away on the show. No cars yet, <laughs> but I do ask. Okay. Yeah, but well, I do ask for you, free books. You may have a surviving sissy, my family oh, affair wonderful. of life in Hollywood uh, book. And since we were talking about awards, I'll tell you a, a quick story mm-hmm. about Amy Tan, uh, who yes. is also Asian, but yes. she had written the book Saving Fish from Drowning as if they needed saving, but this was a very popular book, and I directed her reading her audio book of it, and she had done such a good job, and you know, an Audi Award is like the Oscar of the spoken word, Mm. so we, um, I had actually won two or three of them, but we were nominated, and Amy was nominated, so I called her up, and I said, Amy, isn't this great? We won the Audi, and she said, yeah, but when they first called, I thought I'd want a car. <laughs> no cars, but nice little crystal plaques. That's that's okay. I know it's always Maybe we can that's sell always them on a eBay. disappointment. <laughs> it's a, you just can't never enough. Actually, that brings me back. What is the what is one of my theories about child actors turning out like Lindsay Lohan or anyone else who has some problem with substance abuse or just seems to take a dive off the cliff? What what would you say the chances are that 
um, or, or one of the reasons I think uh, that might contribute to that phenomena is the um, what have you done for me lately? So the pressure that comes from you know doing a hit or or being uh, notable in Hollywood is very high. Even if you've had something, uh, a big hit or a great movie, then it's like, well, what have you done lately? Or, you know, what's that next thing? And if you can't sustain that, uh, then, then there, that you can sort of derail. Is that, is that a possible, uh, not motive, but explanation of why some of these, uh, seemingly, you know, you have everything. Why aren't you happy? Yes, exactly. And w- and it is even more pronounced with child stars that are teens are going through uh, that very difficult age of trying to find themselves as a young teenager and then going on to be a successful adult. Mm-hmm. And the problem mm-hmm. is when one starts acting so young, everything is done for them. So they have the hairstylist and the wardrobe person. They have an agent that gets them the roles. They have a parent that gets them there on time. They have somebody else, perhaps a manager, that is mapping out their career. Mm -hmm. Well, whoops, I, you know, I, I'm not on the show anymore. Well, where's my limelight? Where's my hairstylist? Mm -hmm. Where's my wardrobe people? They have not developed the skills. So okay. not only perhaps might they not get the next big starring role because they're typecast or because they're going through an awkward age from 15 to 18, which is very difficult, mm-hmm. um, but they don't know how. So I work with Paul Peterson, um, who established a minor consideration, a nonprofit for child stars, and um, huh. he's now turning over the reins to Scott Schwartz because... Uh, it, he established the Coogan's Law. Now, you remember um, Mr. Coogan. Uh, he was like the highest paid silent star. He was oh, yes, a yes. child. He was okay. making a million dollars, and he lost it all. Mm. So there is a law that has been established that now, for any child who works even one day in the industry, a portion of what they make has to be put into a separate business account that nobody can touch mm. until the child turns 18 and then they get their money. Great. Great. That's a great example of how law can be used for good. <laughs> right. However, sometimes, like my son did a lot of things, and uh, so I saved uh, dutifully all of his money. I gave him all his money from the Coogan account. Uh-huh. Um, and then a week later, I said, oh, so how are you doing with the money? He said, it's all gone. Ah. He said, everything in a week, because even even if they get it, they don't have any skills right. about then. Right. How do you save it? What do you invest in, et cetera? Did you ground him? Uh, <laughs> no, but I certainly sat him down and gave him some financial lessons, and he now works for a bank. Oh, there you go. There you go. That's great. So, so tell me, uh, you, you have a great love story. So, I'm all about love stories. So, tell me what happened and how you met your husband. Well, I had been dating a lot, and you know, it was a disco era, and set up photo play dates. And I was getting older and getting older. I said, "Well, this is ridiculous. I just want somebody that I can love, that I get along with." So I was about yeah, wait, Define older. Okay, you just did. Okay, 32. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and, what? <laughs> and I said, well, where, where is somebody that I can love and mm-hmm. be married? So I was in Palm Springs, and I put it in my head, and I said, the next person I meet, I am going to marry. Well, so don't you know, onto the tennis court, I was uh, playing with my friend Arlene Golanka and a friend of hers, And we were going to play doubles. And so this six foot three guy glumps onto the court. And I said, oh, is that him? I guess that's him. (laughs) So we started playing tennis. And at that time, it was pretty good. And I just smashed in an ace serve. And then he looked at me and said, oh, finally a woman that can play tennis. I'm going to get married. And I just turned aside and went, ha, ha, ha. You have and no uh, idea. Three years later, <laughs> we were married, and we've been married for thirty-four years. Wow! Now, now we should have him on next time and see what his side of the story is. But uh, no, that sounds. He hates that. Story. Does he hate? I had a feeling. Oh, on, I had a Daddy. feeling. <laughs> 
it wasn't that simple. <laughs> well, that's yeah. wonderful. So what you were doing photo play, what were you saying? Photo play? Yeah, you back, were... back then they uh-huh. had like uh, magazines like People or, you know, USA mm-hmm. that they have now. But they had like photo play and they would take pictures, big pictures of people with faux dates. They, they weren't really dating, but they needed a little romance uh, in their magazines. Okay. So they would, so I would go a lot on these fix up dates. Oh, photo shoot. I photo see. Shoot. Yeah. So uh, with you and another guy. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. But they were fake. Yes. Faux photo. Got it. Got it. So now yes. you have a real guy. Yeah, and what would you yeah, say? Everybody. What would you say? Um, the number one reason why you still talk about him like you really, really love him, which I can hear in your voice. What What's the key to success for a marriage? Um, you really have to like the person. I think <laughs> um, you do. I mean, there's there's infatuation, and there might be other causations where I say, oh, this person has money or this person has, you know, nice blue eyes or this person, I like the way he walks. I, you really, I think, have to like the person mm. and trust the person. Mm-hmm. Um, I get mad at him. He gets mad at me. Um, but I know I can trust him. And, uh, and it isn't a love of the infatuation love. It's mm-hmm. a love like, you know, you are really a nice person. Mm-hmm. If there was somebody that was struggling by the side of the road, he would stop and help that person. Mm -hmm. He's Mm -hmm. that type of a person. That's great. That's great. So what would you say are the top three events in your life that shaped who you are? One was doing the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Um, Another was uh, when our house burned down. And the third one was when my husband died twice. Okay, just minor things. So, Let's go to the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are just minor things that were shaping me and molding me. Yeah. Um, yes. Those, so, those were, I think, about the three top ones. Okay, so let's go. Your house burned down from foul play. Uh, I, I had a new dryer, and uh, the fellow came to plug it in, uh-huh. and uh, he said, this cord doesn't reach. And he said, do you have an extension cord? So I went into the house. I said, this is the only cord that I could find. Mm -hmm. I said, but it doesn't have three prongs. Oh, that's okay. We'll just bend the third one down. Plugged it in. Did my first drying job. Uh The uh, dryer caught on fire. The uh, garage caught on fire. The roof caught on fire. And thank goodness I was there to call 911 running up my driveway and saying, my house is on fire. Come quickly, please. Uh, Okay. And, And what did that teach you? Um, to not buy a dryer from that company <laughs> ever again. <laughs> I deserve that answer. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to your husband. So he almost died twice. How does that he happen? He did die twice. Oh, he did, he die. did die twice. Okay, he died and twice. At the same time, he had um, he had cramps in his hand, and me being and this happened about two years ago. Being a dutiful wife. I went online to find potassium, which is good for cramps. Mm -hmm. I found online this wonderful bottle of potassium crystals. Mm -hmm. I had to uh, send away for it. Strangely enough, I got this package that was from Vietnam. I said, I didn't order anything from Vietnam. But I opened it, and here were potassium crystals that were manufactured and sent from this country. Mm -hmm. So I was away on a trip. I came back. And my son picked me up at the airport. I said, where's dad? Went back home. Oh, I'm telling you, he was white. He was shivering. Um, called 911, much to his chagrin. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Right. So I did it anyway. And they came very quickly. He, the, the fellow came over. He says, well, I think your husband's having a heart attack. <sighs> I said, oh. They whisked him away really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, my son and his girlfriend and I jumped in the car to follow them. Well, half hour later, we're in the emergency room. We haven't heard anything. We hear code blue. Ooh. So anyway, that's it's all in my book. But he died. Yeah. They resuscitated him. He died again, resuscitated him. I'm praying. I said, come on, God, come on, prayer chain. Mm-hmm. Let's not mm-hmm. let this wonderful person go yet. I need him. I like him. He's a nice person. So... <laughs> Um, his potassium level was over nine. 
The doctors say nobody survives over that. Mm. And the second time they came back out, I said, you save him. Mm. You save him. Mm -hmm. They went back. They saved him. Then they did dialysis, and, and he's okay. But, you know, those types of things make you value every single Absolutely. minute. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it was the crystals that, that uh, put him over? Yes. Okay. And did and he have a, did he have a, a an other experience? Did, does he recount? Did, was he aware I certainly of being asked out him. of the body? I said, I certainly asked him. I said, did you see the light? Did you right, see right, the right. palette? Uh -huh. He said, I saw nothing. Okay. He I said, saw oh, nothing. gee, maybe it was going the other way. Perhaps oh. I shouldn't have asked him. <laughs> It was dark. It was black. I said, okay, all right, no more questions. I'm, I'm glad, glad you're here. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know him better than you, Marissa. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, man. Oh, well, I'm glad that he's still here, totally. But what did that teach you besides the crystal part? About really valuing mm -hmm. those, and it isn't carpe diem, it's carpe minute. Ah, um, that yeah. every minutes that's around is is another opportunity and a chance to bring joy mm -hmm. to accept joy to be grateful mm -hmm. um yep. and that really molded my life i'm a much better person i think because of that really big experience and mm -hmm. i know all your listeners and and everybody has obstacles and things that they have to go over such you know really traumatic things right. that might happen and that's a part of my book, In Surviving Sissy. I survived Sissy. You survive some things like this. Mm -hmm. And you learn to thrive maybe even through the turmoil or afterwards mm -hmm. saying, okay, I right. understand so much more about life and I value it so much more. Right, right. But what about people who cannot mm, see past their, their tragedies? What do you, you say know, to them? It's, it's very difficult for me to see people like that, maybe because I have not been that depressed. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been really depressed, and just calling on, I think you cannot just rely on everything that, that is just you, even mm -hmm. though I was almost an anthropology uh, major, and I really believe that we are homo sapiens, and we do so many things by instinct. Right. Um, but I do believe, if you say, okay, God, you... Are, are leading me, or, or Allah, or whomever is your higher spirit, mm -hmm. that that is guiding you someplace, and that you may think you may never never get out of it anything. I was at an IRS audit. My husband died. You know, I'm trying to refinance a house. You know, that the water is not here. Mm -hmm. All of those things. How am I going to get through this? I said, because it's a cycle, and mm -hmm. not everything is just horrible, and God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And mm -hmm. it, to me, right. it just makes you stronger. Right. And I don't take drugs. I think that if you couple it with drugs, then then yes, you're a goner. Mm -hmm. Prescription or non-prescription? I don't take. I take vitamins. Okay. I mean, I and that is one of the things that got me through being a child star too. So many of my brethren and my peers, even the little girl on my show, Anisa Jones. Mm -hmm. She died at 18. Oh, really? Of drug intoxication, yes. Wow. And the little boy uh -huh. was drugs and alcohol, and his parents took money from him. So he didn't have any money, mm. and he was just really down the same path as Anisa. Mm. And then finally, his family did an intervention. It was a nice, big Mormon family, and they said, look, you get off drugs and alcohol, or we are divorcing you as a family. Mm-hmm. That finally got to him. Okay. And he would be proud to tell you now that he's been clean and sober for like 12 years. Oh, that's fabulous. So so it is, I, I have to go to break, but when we get back, remind me to ask you if you know any statistics around, you know, child stars and, and drugs and alcohol and all that. All right. But we have to take a break from uh, our, my fabulous guest, Kathy Garver, who is uh, visiting from Tennessee, <laughs> where she's doing a book signing for Surviving Sissy. And we'll be back after we thank our sponsors in 2 and 2. Peace in and peace out. 
Have a sports injury? Is your posture pulling you down? Does your body feel like it needs a tune-up? Have you been in an accident and you're not getting real relief from the pain? Then it's time for a free consultation with the experienced, comfortable expertise at Seal Beach Physical Therapy. With offices conveniently located in Newport Beach, Thousand Oaks, Moore Park, and Seal Beach, don't delay. Make your body pain disappear with excellent hands and state-of-the-art equipment at Seal Beach Physical Therapy. That's SealBeachPT.com. SealBeachPT.com. Interested in helping out firefighters who are going above and beyond below the border? EMS for Baja is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to enhance the quality of life in Baja, Mexico Peninsula by building a regional training center for the fire department operations, EMS, and emergency management. To become a supporting partner, please visit EMS for Baja on Facebook. That's EMS, the number four, Baja. And we're back. You are listening to my weekly talk radio show out of the Sunset Gower Studios and CNBC News Radio on Thursdays called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. And we have today a child star who made it into adult star, uh, Kathy Garver, who is calling in from Tennessee. She is, if you recognize her, Sissy from the very successful TV show called A Family Affair. And that was with Brian Keith and I forget the Sebastian name. Sebastian Cabot. Sebastian and, Cabot. Yeah. Right. And that is a wonderful actor. Yes. Yes. And what would, that story was an interesting story because you're, you had uh, siblings, twin siblings, and your parents had been killed. And so you yes. were being raised by your uncle, who was Brian Keith, and then the butler or the, the, the butler nanny. Right. What yes, was, we would call him a nanny today. A he nanny. was a gentleman's gentleman, <laughs> a manservant. Yes. What, what What were the the highlights of working on that show for those for those uh, nostalgia buffs that are listening? Well, one, it lasted for five years. That was pretty much of the major yes. highlight. Yeah. Uh, and we uh, got to know each other very well. Um, it's uh, always good for an actor to have a steady job. So uh, I enjoyed the show very much. It has turned out, uh, when one looks back into the the annals of uh, TV history or whatever, it was a show that embraced a lot of firsts. Mm -hmm. Um, As you initiated the conversation, it was uh, unusual to have an uncle raise children. So this was really kind of one of the first dysfunctional families. (laughs) It wasn't the mom and the dad and the kids. Right. So it was kind of delving into a different type of family that could be assembled and still loved. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the first shows in color. We had a big kaleidoscope that was uh, turning and showing sparkling rays of blues and greens and reds. That was to remind everybody, yet this is indeed in color. And so then they got it. So, uh, and also it was one of the first shows where an actor uh, actually got a part of the financial uh, uh, fruits of our labor. At that time, Don Federson, and he had initiated it with Fred McMurray and my three sons. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, you know, big movie stars did not go on television. Oh, my gosh, that awful, horrid little box. Right. (laughs) So in order to lure them... Federson promised them they would only have to uh, work for 30 days for a 32-episode series, plus they would get a portion of the profit from the show. Mm, Interesting. That is a big first, because Marianne, who I know you know Don well, she speaks very highly of you and told told me that uh, she might get you, (laughs) would be able to get you to replace her for her doing the uh, 100-year anniversary on Universal. But she had said that all the money from uh, Gilligan's Island, that, you know, from all the replays, she gets nothing. Oh, yes. I mean, we only got paid up until the 10th rerun, and that was kind of de rigueur for the 60s and for residuals. And then, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. Melissa Gilbert, who was the president of SAG at the time, made this deal with the producers uh, that on the web, 
Uh, they didn't have to pay anybody that was in a TV series before 1973. Oh. So this was not such a good deal for her fellow actors, but um. there you go. Yes, Dawn is a great friend of mine. She wrote the foreword in my first book, which was the Family Affair Cookbook, mm-hmm. and then she wrote a wonderful blurb for my new book, Surviving Sissy, and we are uh, working to put together a play that we can both uh, That's work on. That's awesome. I, in. I will definitely be there. Now, Patty Duke wrote your foreword for this book, and you have a relationship with her. How's Patty? <laughs> Patty is great. She's in Idaho, and uh, she's about to do a one-woman show about Mary Todd Lincoln. And I think she would be perfect. You know, it's all these little ladies. I'm like the same size as Patty, the same size as Sally Field. We're all about the same age. Uh Um, So uh, she's going to participate in this new play. And she's, she's doing great. I first met her on the Patty Duke show where I was in like four or five of the episodes playing her friend. Mm-hmm. And we've just been friends ever since. Well, it, please do invite her on my show for me. <laughs> I would love to I have would her. be happy to. I know she'd love to. <laughs> That's great. And she has a lot of good things to say about hope and happiness and her own trials and tribulations and how she was finally able to make that transition mm-hmm. to a happy adult from some kind of child also abuse as she was starring in so many of her roles. Mm. Now she had some abuse in her childhood as well. Is well, that what yes. you just said? Yeah. Yes. So, so mm-hmm. here's, here's the interesting thing. Let's, let's stop for a second on that. Um, one of my, my, uh, moose on the table, <laughs> I call the moose on the table cause I'm originally from Canada. It's, you know, the elephant in the room. Yeah. So yeah. my version is, let's <laughs> so put the moose on the table. Exactly. Thank you. So, so, Many people, uh, if they if they believe if they're if they're BS if their belief system is that somehow I'm entitled when I come into the planet for a normal childhood, Ozzie and Harriet, you know, Little House on the Prairie, the normal functional home, uh, and if I don't get that, that somehow I have a right to be bitter, angry, pissed off, uh, you know, always playing catch up, unhappy, depressed. And my premise is that, you know, especially with the statistics, if you look at psychology today, it says seven out of 10 are born in dysfunctional homes of some kind. Oprah says it's as high as eight out of 10. Asian Oprah agrees with her. And, and that statistic, then if that's the truth, then we will have many, many uh, uh, 70% of people walking around this planet unhappy, no hope, hopelessness, and and walking around trying to find some semblance of happy outside of themselves, either through drugs or some kind of addiction. So my one of the reasons why I'm on the air, and I'm I, and I'm grateful for all of the people who who are listening. That the audience has grown and grown. I believe it's because. The choice is you either see life as uh, something that happened that you expand from. So any pain or any, any abuse that you've had, if you can switch your mind around from entitlement, and I feel sorry for myself for what the crap happened to me, to, wow, this happened to me, and what developed in me as a result of this to make me have a better life or an expanded life, then life becomes better. Just just from that switch in the frame, which I can tell you have, <laughs> which Dawn has, which which is why you look as great as you do, and which is why you sound as good as you do. No? Because I agree with you 180%. <laughs> okay. And they are still child stars that say, oh, you know, this, this happened to me, this happened to me. I said, stop being a victim. Yes. You are not a victim. You make choices. And if you want to have a choice that, oh, this is all piling on me and oh, poor me, you're never going to get anywhere and you are not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. It's even like Ben Carson. I'm not so political, but you look at the place where he came from. He says, well, I'm not going, his mother, you know, with all those kids, and she says, you're going to learn to read and you are going to go on. This is a single mother. He said, Mm -hmm. you are not going to be pushed down by anything that people have told you or that you can't do you can do anything right you can and do, do anything. anything and it is as you say that little click mm-hmm. oh and maybe it takes one little tiny accomplishment you say wow oh, hey mm-hmm. that was pretty good i mm-hmm. did that mm-hmm. i mean i i am thrilled to 
be an award-winning author. Well, wow, did I ever think that I would be an award-winning mm-hmm. author? Well, mm-hmm. no, that was not in, in, I, I had ever planned out to <laughs> right, be. Right. But if you start on a road and you get uh, little accomplishments that, that go, you make a, mm-hmm. bake a perfect cake, you know, you knit a sweater, oh my gosh, yeah. you painted that picture, mm-hmm. you drew that, mm-hmm. all of those little wonderful accomplishments pile up mm-hmm. and you start feeling really kind of good about yourself. Right, right, absolutely. I have begun this practice in the last couple of years. Every child that I see, if they are at all open to my my smiling or my goofy faces at them, I get down to their level, I look in their eyes and say, you can accomplish anything you put your heart and mind to, because that was told to be my, by J, J, my math teacher, J.J. Bristow, when I was in 10th grade, and it made a tremendous difference in my life. And I can see the difference that makes. And that's the work that you're doing, which is why I am presenting you with today's Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award. So you got two awards today. Kathy Garver. Wow. I'm <laughs> it's, doubly blessed. <laughs> it's Dr. Marissa's Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award. Be- Thank you. Absolutely. Thank we'll you. Give you a I, I, there you go. Oh <laughs> you get boy, more applause. And applause too. <laughs> because well, we need I must say, that. when I first started my book, mm-hmm. I was just going to write like, um, this is my life, memoir. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. as it started evolving, and then it, it, there became Hollywood history in it. And then at the end, and I was threading it through, there's this little thread theories how we're all connected, or I, that experience happened because of a particular thread. And then at the end, it became very inspirational. And I didn't intend it to be that way, <laughs> but people that have read it have been inspired by it. Mm. People that have come up to my book signing. I mean, this lady yesterday, when I was doing another book signing, she came up to me and started crying. Aww. And I said, oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, what's, what's the matter? She said, I, I was just abused as, as a child, and I used to watch Family Affair, and it was so comforting to me, mm-hmm. and it made me feel so good. And uh, she said, I apologize. I said, no, that's fine. I said, I'm glad that there mm-hmm. was something that gave you comfort, yes. you know, to which that you would, you know, that you could go and, and feel good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it makes me happy, and I'm glad that I'm, I'm the beneficial person on this planet because yeah. I didn't think that that was going to be where my path was necessarily mm-hmm. taking me, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm glad it yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the reality is all 7.3 billion of us have the capacity to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Actually, we all are. We just don't recognize it. And if part of this work is to recognize it of yourself and then to recognize it in others. Uh, you know, two things that keep us, the people outside may not encourage us. And then the, the person inside in our head, that critic, also keeps us from recognizing it. So you've done something that I, I tell my clients all the time. You bake your own cake, baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you That's have right. baked your own cake. The compliments and the criticism are just icing. But you know that you're a beneficial presence because I can see it in your work. Any- uh, well, thank you. <laughs> and even if you know that that cake doesn't rise and, and it deflates a little, that still tastes good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Final word, is there any love and peace shout outs that le- you would like to give to anybody out in the listening land? To my son, to my husband. I miss you very much. I love you so very, very much. Mm. I'll be home soon from being out on the road for all my my other friends and the people that I know and will know. Yes, that you inspire. Thank you so much, Kathy Garver. (laughs) Surviving Sissy, go out and get it. Uh, The Asian Oprah giveaway for the first person that goes to my website at for balance.org and says, uh, let's see, a family affair on the subject line. We'll get a copy of that book. So that is it for today's Okay, I just episode. want to remind people that okay. they can get the book uh, on my website. They can get an autograph oh, yes. copy yes. on uh, www.kathygarver.com. That's Kathy with a K. And, of course, they can go to Amazon. My other award that I think I told you was number one, on Amazon for mm-hmm. Hollywood history, so they can also go to Amazon. 
Fabulous. Get in that shameless yes, no, no, no. I, and I apologize. I apologize. I usually ask that right after the break, but I think we were involved in some kind of scandal or something, and I forgot. <laughs> we were trying but, to find the statistic for ex oh, child yes. stars and their drug use. Yes. Did Did you have that? I don't have it yet, but okay. it will be in my new book the in March. Th- there you go. And, Something and that's to look because of you. To. I'm going to look it up and add a little gravitas to there, my work. There we go. There we go. Just make sure you say Dr. Marissa told you to do that. I will. I will. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's my shameless. <laughs> but uh, uh, one more time, if we're looking for Kathy Garver, we find her at kathygarver.com. www.kathygarver.com. With a K. And then yes. are, I'm sure are you Facebook as well. K A T H Y G A R V E R. Great, and go give her the finger. I mean, a thumbs up at her <laughs> Facebook page. And thank you again. Thanks, Rita. <laughs> All right. Well, that was super fun. And uh, we are at the end of the show, where I invite you to my balance bar. Step up today is day three on the 21 day fast from complaining with Dr. Marissa. We are on round 53. Yes, I've been doing this fast since July 1st, 2001 and continue to do it from all around the world and right now from Australia. So the, the tip for day three is it's easier to stop a bad habit like complaining if I have a new habit to replace it with like gratitude. So starting today, set up your day up Set your day up for not complaining by affirming by affirming what is good in your life. Dr. Wayne Dyer, who we just lost, to the other side. He's still here, but on the other side, he suggests five things that you're grateful for. I'm a recovering overachiever, so I say eight. And you all know, if you've been following me for a while, eight is a lucky number in Chinese. It's a homonym for good fortune. So I want you to start every single day with eight gratitudes as specific as possible about your life. And I promise you, if you start the day like that, you will set a path for positivity and you will put on your life jacket with a silver and gold lining. So that is today's uh, balance tip on the 21 day fast from complaining. You too can join officially uh, at fourbalance.org. And you'd want to do that if you can go 21 days without complaining in a row. Contact me after you have registered and you will receive a free uh, 52 card pick me up stacking the deck for life balance with Dr. Marissa's motivational card back, which is all original Marissa isms on there. And I get a lot of my balance tips from that pack. So please do join the fast, especially if you don't like hearing yourself or others around you complain. And that's it for today's show. Tune in next week. We have another call-in show. I will be back <laughs> from Australia and uh, from the land down under and joining you again where I get to be Dr. Marissa, the kinder, gentler Dr. Laura with call-ins about relationships, your health and well-being, and a job that you might hate. So... That's it for Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get Balance with Dr. Marissa Pay. That's P for positive, E-I. And remember, it's all about balance. Peace in and peace out. To take away the part of me wants to stay It's all I want to hear my life and sing along For without it there's no laughter No tears Lonely days after no memories for the way things used to be many a friend has stopped along the Another melody
Show the world.